Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us again today. I have with me my Deputy Governor for Budget and Economy, Dan Hines, and our IDPH Director, Ngazi Azike. From the very beginning of our COVID-19 response, my purpose in appearing before you each day has been to fully inform our residents and to guide us through the impacts of this virus, its medical consequences, and its effects on all aspects of our way of life. I've been straightforward with you about what we know and of equal importance, what we don't know to make sure that you have the information that you need to keep yourselves and your loved ones safe and to help each other overcome the potentially devastating consequences of this virus. After discussing it with legislative leaders on both sides of the aisle, today I want to review with you the financial impacts of COVID-19 on our state budget and walk you through our early projections regarding the revenue shortfalls that Illinois is facing due to the impacts of COVID-19. As I do so, keep in mind that these are preliminary and estimated figures since this virus is not yet vanquished and there remains so much uncertainty still about when that will happen. Folks, you don't have to be an ep epidemiologist to see that the virus is going to hit our budget hard. A reality that is being visited upon every state in the United States. The bottom line is this. Budget experts estimate that Illinois will have a $2.7 billion shortfall of revenues for this fiscal year and a $4.6 billion shortfall for next fiscal year. Let me dig into those numbers a little so that you can see where the challenges really lie. As a general rule of thumb, state budgets across the United States are dependent upon taxes on income, sales, and other sources, such as lotteries and gaming, for a substantial portion of their state budgets. In every state, the coronavirus pandemic has substantially disrupted those revenue sources. That's true regardless of political affiliation and regardless of how fast or slow a state's leadership moved to implement social distancing measures. Even those few states still operating without a stay-at-home order are facing massive fiscal hardship. This is a public health crisis, but it is accompanied by massive economic disruption that's unprecedented in modern history. Last February, when I presented a fiscal year 2021 budget proposal, my Office of Management and Budget released general funds revenue forecasts for the remainder of fiscal year 20 and for fiscal year 21. With those estimates in hand, I proposed a balanced budget, a budget that invested in our long-term strengths that will lead to our future economic growth, schools, job creation, infrastructure maintenance, human services, public safety. And I acknowledged the intractable realities of Illinois' structural budget deficiencies and proposed facing them head on. That budget proposal represented an essential next step on the path toward fiscal health for Illinois. Based on our new preliminary projections on the economic impact of COVID-19, that path has fundamentally diminished to the narrowest of paths. Let's start with fiscal year 2020. Estimates by our Department of Revenue economists show a 7% drop in our state source revenue. That's the $2.7 billion that I mentioned earlier. $1 billion of that decline is due to the three-month extension of the April 15th deadline for filing 2019 income tax returns. Because of that extension, those revenues will be received in FY21 instead of in FY20. So in looking to close the FY20 fiscal gap, we have already begun taking steps to reduce expenditures, asking agency directors to enact spending reductions and efficiencies. Uh, 
And I'll remind you that earlier this year, we asked those directors to identify efficiencies when we prepared for the FY21 budget and secured a savings plan of nearly a billion dollars over three years, much of which our agencies were already moving toward ahead of schedule. That said, my cabinet members are hard at work realizing as much of those savings far sooner. Beyond that, my team has been working with the treasurer and the controller to leverage over $700 million in other state funds to support the operations of state government and issue up to $1.2 billion in short-term borrowing as constitutionally permitted in unexpected situations like this one. Both Treasurer Frerichs and Comptroller Mendoza have offered tremendously creative and responsible leadership in shifting our dollars to where they can mo be most impactful as a response to COVID-19. This is not the path any of us would choose under normal circumstances, but it is the best path available to us with the two and a half months left in this fiscal year. <clears throat> Our state has made tremendous fiscal progress in the last one and a half years, enacting a balanced budget, reducing our bill backlog by nearly a billion dollars in my first year in office, and reducing our late payment penalties from the $950 million they had reached before I became governor to just over $100 million instead this fiscal year. This crisis, however, will take us off course for a little while, and we must put ourselves back on track as soon as we can. That brings me to fiscal year 2021. With our new revenue projections, my administration is estimating that there will be at least $4.6 billion less in state revenues than our Department of Revenue originally estimated. Accounting for paying back the short-term borrowing that we must do in fiscal year 20, our total budgetary gap for FY21 is $6.2 billion. And if in November, the constitutional amendment to move from a flat tax to a graduated tax system doesn't pass, the, that budgetary gap will expand to $7.4 billion. Illinoisans are all too familiar with the pain the lack of a state budget can cause. So let me just say up front, we will not go without a state budget. We will need to make extraordinarily difficult decisions on top of the difficult decisions that we've already made. But together with the state legislature, we will make them. And we will do so with an unswerving dedication to fairness. In my inaugural address, I said that I would not balance the budget on the backs of the starving, the sick, and the suffering. It's during our most trying moments that our resolve is truly tested. Our moral character as a state is tested. So in the midst of a pandemic, I am more resolute than ever to protect those who are suffering physical and financial hardship from it. I want to express my gratitude to our Illinois congressional delegation, our senators and congressmen of both parties for their support for the first CARES Act, which provides up to $2.7 billion to cover state government expenditures in response to the pandemic. It also provides critical support for Illinois' education agencies, local governments, senior aid, transit systems, hospitals, and many other areas. This COVID response funding is very important. It will directly support our work to secure PPE and ventilators, to stand up alternate care facilities and alternate housing, to help us keep people safe and save lives. But I wanna be clear, these dollars can be used to cover only new expenditures related to coronavirus. Currently, this funding cannot be used to make up for state government revenue shortfalls that have been a result of coronavirus. That leaves states to face this unprecedented financial hole on their own if the Congress doesn't pass a CARES Act II to support state governments. 
Lawmakers on both sides of the aisle from across the nation have pointed out that it is absolutely critical that Congress pass another stimulus bill to assist states and territories through this crisis. The federal government acted swiftly to step in and support businesses and corporations so that they can come out on the other side of this and jumpstart the economy. But the same type of action is needed in support of state governments. This is about ensuring that in the wake of this pandemic, the nation isn't facing down a second storm standing in the way of funding for schools and health care, clean water and clean air, greater public safety, more job creating small businesses, improved care for our most vulnerable children and seniors. This is about the continuity of the essential services that give people a real chance. Last year, Illinois Republicans and Democrats alike rolled up our sleeves and produced a bipartisan balanced budget that has begun to put our state back on a sound fiscal path. It's the most fundamental task of state government. And even under these unprecedented circumstances, it must be carried out. And it will be. Responsible leadership on both sides are committed to doing so. Illinois, when I said that we were all in this together, that's true. From Cairo to Chicago, from Rockford to Metropolis, we are one Illinois. But it's also true across the country. We are one nation. And as a nation made up of the 50 states, we are facing, by early estimates, state budget deficits of at least a half a trillion dollars, largely concentrated in this coming fiscal year. Our greatest president once said, the legitimate object of government is to do for a community of people whatever they need to have done, but cannot do at all, or cannot so well do for themselves in their separate and individual capacities. President Lincoln's words ring true today, so we ask the Congress to do for the states what it alone can do to get us through this crisis together. Thank you, and now I'd like to invite Dr. Zike to give today's medical update. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me start by thanking our governor for his commitment to the people of Illinois and all the residents across all the communities. I hope everyone is continuing to do their best to stay healthy, not only physically, but also emotionally. These are trying times, but this is an indicator of our resilience. I'm proud of the way that Illinois has responded thus far. But make no mistake, even though we are flattening the curve, we still have a ways to go, and we have to tough this out together. I report to you today that we have had 1,346 new cases over the last 24 hours and unfortunately 80 additional lives lost to COVID-19. This brings our total case count for the state of Illinois to 24,593, along with 948 lives lost. During these difficult times, I'd like to share information about recent analysis of early data to offer even just a glimmer of hope. Analysis shows that implementing community mitigation strategies or non-pharmaceutical interventions, NPIs, during this pandemic can and will and has slowed the spread of infection. This includes the measures that we've all been taking, hand washing, covering our cough, wearing a mask. These personal measures have been effective, but also the banning of mass gatherings, the staying at home, the social distancing, the environmental cleaning, these are also key strategies at the community level. These measures are working, even though we continue to see new cases, even though we continue to report new deaths. Remember, this is a marathon. We are seeing a slowed rate of increase. These measures are cumulatively beneficial over time, but we have to stay the course. I'd like to take this opportunity to give a shout out to all the essential workers who are not often thanked for the work that they do to keep our state moving. There are Illinoisans in the fields, on the farms, in the grocery stores, restocking our shelves, 
postal workers, staff delivering the goods that we've ordered online to stay at home, not to mention the truck drivers keeping our country connected. These, those working in banks ensure that we have access to the money we need, the people who are picking up our, our refuse, and so many others who are often overlooked during this pandemic. I salute you all and thank you for your service. We must all continue to do our part to protect the health of all of Illinois. We thank you for all that you're doing to move our country forward. Remember that the actions that we take today will set us up for a better future. We are doing this together. Let's remain all in Illinois. And now I will translate comments into Spanish. Buenas tardes y quiero dar gracias al gobernador por su compromiso a Illinois y sus residentes en todas las comunidades. Realmente, él se preocupa mucho sobre esta pandemia y, este, y está haciendo lo que es necesario para mantener saludable a Illinois. Espero que todos están haciendo todo lo posible para mantenerse saludables, no solo físicamente, pero también emocionalmente. Estos tiempos difíciles son un gran indicador de resiliencia. Estoy orgulloso de la forma en que Illinois ha respondido. Pero no se equivoquen. Ya que estamos me mejorando, todavía tenemos un camino adelante. Sin embargo, estoy segura de que podemos hacerlo juntos. Hoy, IDPH informa que 1,346 personas adicionales han sido enfermos con el virus y perdimos 80 vidas. Eso causa un total de 24,593 personas que fueron positivo, incluyendo 948 muertes. Durante estos tiempos difíciles, me gustaría compartir información sobre el análisis reciente de los primeros datos para ofrecer un rayo de esperanza. Un análisis muestra que la implementación de estrategias de mitigación aquí en Illinois está retrasando la transmisión de infecciones. Todo lo que están haciendo, lavarse las manos, cubrirse el tos y usar una máscara, el distanciamiento social, la, limpia, la limpieza en espacios comunitarios, el orden de quedarse en casa, todo está trabajando. Puede ser difícil cumplir con estas medidas por tantas semanas y meses, especialmente cuando seguimos viendo nuevos casos y muertes pero los beneficios se verán confirmados. Estas medidas tendrán un buen impacto, pero debemos mantener el rumbo. Me gustaría aprovechar esta oportunidad para saludar a todos los trabajadores esenciales que a veces no se les agradece por el trabajo que están haciendo para mantener nuestro estado. Estos son los trabajadores en los campos, y los, en los ranchos, las personas en las tiendas, muchísimas gracias a todos ustedes. También no te olvides las trabajadores postales y otros trabajadores que entregan los productos que estamos ordenados por internet. Los camioneros, los que trabajan en los bancos, todos están nuestros giros. Las personas que recogen nuestro basura y muchas otras que trabajan durante esta pandemia. Gracias por su servicio. Todos debemos continuar haciendo nuestra parte para proteger a nuestros trabajadores médicos y la policía y bomberos, pero también a todos los que traba, trabajan para que nuestro país siga avanzado. Recuerden que las acciones que tomamos hoy nos prepara para un futuro mejor. Haremos esto juntos. Gracias. And with that, I will turn it over to Governor Prisker for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy to take any questions from our stalwart reporters who <laughs> seem to show up uh, just about every day. Thank you, Governor. What, with those numbers, which sound pretty scary, 
Is it time to rethink the graduated income tax? Look, I, it's on the ballot for November. I think people will be making their own decision about it. Um, I would argue in a way that uh, we may need it now more than ever. Um, and of course, we this isn't just about one year. Um, it's about fixing the structural deficit that exists for the state. Uh, we're in a pandemic. We're in an emergency. This crisis is causing a significant uh, a disruption to our fiscal year coming up, um, but we, we have many years ahead, and I think a fairer tax system makes sense to me. There is a report today about a secret flight of PPE. Can you give us more information, and do you really have to make it secret because otherwise the feds might take the masks and gowns that you're trying to bring here to Illinois? Well, look, I'm responsible for making sure that we have the PPE and the ventilators uh, that, that we need for the state. The federal government, as we've talked about many times, uh, has not been a, a great partner in that. They've helped. They've helped, and I want to give credit for what we've gotten from the federal government, but, but it's only really, in the end, a few days' worth of items. Uh, and so we've had to search uh, the entire globe to find what we need. Uh, shipping is very difficult, and so we're doing what we need to do uh, to make sure that we get uh, you know, the kind of PPE that we need. Um, it is true that the federal government seems to be interrupting supplies uh, that are being sent elsewhere in the nation, and so I wanted to make sure that we receive what we ordered. And when will you get that shipment, do you think? I don't know the days on which those will arrive, but, um, but they are, you know, scheduled to arrive. Uh, there's a, from one of my colleagues, uh, Katie Kim, some states, Iowa, released the names of the senior health care facilities and the nursing homes with coronavirus infections. Why not Illinois? Um, I'm happy to turn it over to the doctor. The IDPH reports um, quite a lot about our nursing homes and the, you know, the infection rate, but I'm happy to turn it over to you. So uh, releasing information regarding uh, outbreaks that happen in facilities is not something that's new to us. IDPH regularly does put that information out. Um, I will take that back to the team if we haven't been updating our list. Thank you. Also, right now family members with loved ones in nursing homes can only find out if a positive case or death if the nursing home voluntarily releases this info. What would you say to those families who are worried and they're wondering if their loved one is at risk? No, again, remember that this is an unprecedented time and traditionally we know that we've had potentially some shortages in staff in the nursing homes, particularly among the staff who are sick themselves. So I think in the midst of trying to check every member of everybody living in the nursing home to make sure that they're not sick, to make sure that they're separating people who've been exposed from people who are sick, from people who haven't been exposed, to doing the pre pre-shift assessments for all of the employees. I think everyone is being tasked with additional duties. So I think it's absolutely the intention in every nursing home to contact families when they have a loved one that's sick and to give updates. Uh, I'm gonna speak for the nursing homes when I say I probably think it's just backlog and not that they don't want to, but trying to manage all the tasks in addition to caring for the loved ones that they've been tasked with. Might you remind them that that's, this is information that folks are desperate surely, for? Surely, surely. Several state senators uh, are urging the lifting of the stringent social distancing when the Illinois Hospital Association says that the ICU bed capacity is sufficient. Do, is that a factor? Do, will you consider that? Again, I've said day in and day out that uh, we're going to rely upon the epidemiologists and the scientists to tell us what social distancing measures, what uh, stay-at-home measures uh, we need to keep in place in order to keep the population from uh, having a spike of COVID-19 uh, uh, infections. My number one consideration, my number one consideration is the life, safety, and health of the people of our state and of course I am just as eager as all of those state senators and with the president of the United States and everybody else to get everybody back to work but we've got to do it in a fashion that really works for everybody so that we keep customers safe that we keep workers safe and so I'm gonna repeat something I've said almost every day we need widespread testing and we're all working on that no state has widespread testing yet but we are all working on expanding testing we need a comprehensive contact tracing effort which 
Massachusetts has begun to stand up, and that's something that I've been in direct contact with, not only the governor of Massachusetts about, but also with the people who are actually putting that program together, who I happen to know for many years, uh, an organization called Partners in Health. Um, and so we're looking at putting that together for the state of Illinois, so we'll have both of those in the works. We've already talked a lot about uh, testing so you've seen that we're in the works buying machines and the the VTM and everything that's necessary to make sure that our testing increases um, the contact tracing and then something that is really uh, dependent upon the researchers and the doctors and we're cheering them on in every way that we can uh, but it's really up to them and that's the testing that's going on right now over certain kinds of treatments that can be given effectively. They have these, uh, what do they call them, double-blind experiments, um, and uh, they're, some of which is going on in Chicago hospitals, I might add, uh, but it's going on all over the world uh, on things like bremdesivir and hydrochloroquine and everything else. Once we have something established that will keep fewer people from going to the hospital and therefore fewer people going into ICU beds and fewer people getting ventilators, then I think those three things working together, testing, tracing, and treatment, those together together with widely available PPE will help us to begin to reopen commerce across the state. And this is from Tony Arnold at WBEZ. In New York, the death toll sharply increased when they decided to count the victims who never tested positive mm -hmm. but likely died from it. Are you considering doing the same thing here? And is it possible the state's death toll is considerably higher? I'm going to let Dr. Ezekiel answer more broadly. I will tell you that um, it is certainly true that the number of cases of COVID-19 is much higher than what is being tested because we can only test so many people with the number of tests we have. So we should, you know, that's why we have to assume that many, many people have it, and that's why we have a stay-at-home order in place. Um, and so I think it's logical to assume that the the the, the uh, number of people who have passed away is l higher. I don't know whether I would say much higher, but I will turn it over to Dr. ZK. We'll give you a more scientific answer to that yeah. question. So for sure, uh, as the governor correctly stated, the, num the denominator in terms of the total number of people uh, who have cases is grossly underestimated. Um, we know that because we had limited supply of the testing materials, and so then we're trying to find our highest risk people in terms, of, in terms of doing the testing in the first place. But on the death number, I think that one is probably closer to accurate because once you're in the hospital, that's definitely a population that would get tested. Like that was one of our prioritized groups, people who are very sick, who are in the hospital, who are ICU, who have pneumonia. So more likely, uh, the death numbers are close, um, close to actual. We, of course, some could have been missed if there was no no suspicion of, at all, um, but uh, in terms of the numbers that are grossly underestimated, it would be the total number of cases for the state. So the CDC did recently put out the uh, new guidance that we should have a separate column for uh, laboratory confirmed cases and then uh, this second column for probable cases. And so again, most of those probable cases are the people that physicians and public health departments said. Uh, yes, you were the household contact of so-and-so, and, -so, and this person was laboratory confirmed, yeah, you probably have it. So we know that those people exist, and so it's just a matter of do we want to increase those numbers, but even that will probably be a gross uh, underestimation if we just uh, put those probables. We've had a couple of Dr. ZK uh, folks who say they have been tested, they're essential workers, this is especially at Roseland Hospital, and they're still waiting for the results. They did self-impose a quarantine but now they have to get back to work. Their employer saying get back to work. What should they do? So I actually have been in contact, uh, I think, with the VP of Roseland um, as recently as today. And so uh, I am working with my team to make sure that all specimens are sent directly to IDPH lab because, again, the rapid turnover of the results is essential. And so when people send it out to some of these other locations where there's an exorbitant amount of time, decisions can't be made. So um, we're working on that as we speak to make sure that we get timely results. 
Thank and you. May I add to that because I think this is an important part of the answer uh, as well. Uh, there was an article actually this morning about uh, how the commercial labs uh, actually are reporting 30 percent fewer uh, results than they were before. Um, they've had their own issues with processing. Um, and I've, I've talked about this before, how it takes seven to 12 days to get a result from one of the commercial labs. It's the reason, partly, that we've started to build up, not just started, we've been doing it for some time now, building up our resources within the state. It's not just because it's closer by, by location, because it's not about driving time or f even flying time. It really is about who's doing the processing and the and the prioritization of that processing we, you know the people of the state of illinois deserve to get answers as quickly as possible on their tests and so our state labs all of our hospitals are turning around tests in you know one two three days and not seven to twelve days and so that's why it's very concerning to me you know if you remember the criteria for getting tested predominantly is you have symptoms now imagine you start with symptoms and you go get a test and seven to twelve days later what can happen to you in those seven to twelve days if you were already exhibiting some symptoms and you actually had COVID-19 it's almost not worth getting the result back you already are experiencing all of it and in the hospital and you know you didn't need to know uh, at that point but one or two days in or three days in that is a very helpful result have you had talks with all of the state's insurers some of those uh, who have who insure folks auto insurance for instance are offering refunds uh, for or credits because there are definitely fewer claims for auto insurance. Yeah. Now, are you talking to all of them? Because not everyone's doing that. You're right. Not everyone is doing that. And I, m the insurance calls that I really was focused on and that I've made personally have been to the leaders of our health insurance companies to make sure that they're covering COVID related expenses. Uh, but it's an excellent point that I know that the large companies, State Farm and Allstate, are providing rebates and lowering, uh, you know, premiums and so on, um, which is the right thing to do. And I, I think, you know, we should, in fact, be communicating with all of our uh, auto insurance companies to uh, get to ask them them to do the same thing. I don't know which ones that are smaller in the state are doing what you're describing, but we'll go find out. And freelancers are wondering, are they covered by unemployment if you're a freelancer? If you're a, an independent contractor, 1099, if you qualify as that, which is often what a freelancer is, then you would qualify for this new program that the federal government set up to provide unemployment insurance. Parents, of course, still are wondering about school, and then now they're looking ahead to the summer. Summer camp. Do you envision children going to summer camp programs this summer? Again, we're going to make some decisions coming up about what to do about our stay-at-home order, you know, how we will, you know, make adjustments, uh, what needs to remain in place. We still haven't uh, decided about whether, you know, about what to do about schools. You know, we have an April 30 date now, and uh, typically schools, you know, might end in the first or second week of June. Um, and so decisions, you know, need to be made soon uh, to make, uh, you know, parents aware and kids aware of what that next month or month and a half might look like. Um, and I think that will begin to give it some indication about the summer. But again, I'm, you know, we're speculating. Remember, everything about this is new. And so it's very difficult to make projections months in advance of something. But, I, you know, as a parent as, of, of children who have, who have in the past gone to camp, I, I know all the planning is, is occurring now. Um, and so we'll, we'll try to give some indication if we can. Uh, but it's hard to do, I must say, this far in advance. Do you think in the next two weeks, in the next 10 days? I, I'm not I, certainly in the next two weeks we'll, we'll, we'll be, you know, uh, deciding what to do about the April 30 uh, stay at home, the end of the stay at home order that's currently in place. Um, but I'm not sure that in the next 10 days or two weeks that we'll be able to give an answer about summer camp. Okay, thank you. Those are mine. Thank yeah. you. Okay, thank you, Marianne. Any others? Yeah, uh, sorry. To that point, uh, the federal government has released some of their guidelines of the plans that they may have in place of what reopening looks like, and summer camp is one of the things that they would begin to phase in first. So are you looking at, at those federal guidelines? And uh, President Trump yesterday said he was going to be speaking with all of the governors maybe Thursday. Is there anything on the agenda for tomorrow? Yeah, there's a regular call that occurs. Sometimes the president is on the call. Sometimes it's the president and the vice president. It sounds like the president will be on the call uh, for tomorrow because I heard that as well. Um, 
as far as the CDC guidelines, um, let me just say that, you know, I think Dr. Fauci uh, was had it right when he said that, you know, testing and contact tracing are going to be vitally important to making any decisions about what you know, opening things looks like, what the future looks like, um, as I said a little earlier. And I completely agree. And so we've got to ramp up testing, you know, all of us. We've got to get that done. Um, again, you know, we had hoped the federal government would be involved, but uh, in helping us do that, the contact tracing, uh, again, this was a program that, that's been put in place or being put in place by one state that looks to me like it will be very effective. And so those are the two things that we're, you know, focusing on. And I think the CDC guidelines are really in many ways dependent upon this widespread testing and contact tracing. And I'm sure you saw and heard the group of protesters circling the block downstairs, honking and saying, lift the ban. That's got to be a sign of how rambunctious people are going to get the longer this drags on. Uh, well, some of them. With regard to rent control. And some of them are talking about rent control. Right. Just your response to that. And the moratorium on, yeah. Um, so the, the moratorium on rent control in the state is a, is a state law. Um, it can only be lifted by the state legislature and a vote by the state legislature. I know there are offices for the state legislature here in the Thompson Center. I'm not sure there are too many legislators that are here in the building, but um, so, it, you know, it may be that much of that is aimed at them because they're the ones who have to vote on that um, if they do. So, uh, but that is a state law that's currently in place. And I know that, you know, they're just like anybody who wants a change in state law. I think, you know, making their voices heard makes sense. I just got two more added. Let me get, if you don't mind. Let me get, if you don't mind. Craig Wall. Oh, I'm sorry, Craig. I apologize, Craig. And then we'll so you're, you you're, you're hiding yourself. Yes, yeah, I am. Um, a couple things, Governor. First of all, uh, your counterpart in New York is now looking at uh, having people wear masks. We've seen a couple of local municipalities. Mayor Lightfoot said she didn't think today that that was needed. She thinks people are following it. Are you giving any consideration to requiring people to wear masks in public? And if so, where would that apply? I am, I, first of all, I have given a lot of consideration and I have spoken about that here and indeed recommended to people that they wear masks when they're out in public or the, especially when they go to anywhere where they're going to be with, you know, any other group of people, you know, a grocery store, a pharmacy, gas station or anywhere else um, where they know they're going to be with others. Um, so that doesn't, by the way, that doesn't mitigate uh, the idea that you need to maintain your social distance. You know, having the mask on is an additional protection. And let me be clear, wearing a mask is protecting everybody else. So you're doing everybody else a favor or, you know, you're doing the right thing for everybody else in your presence by wearing one, by not wearing one when you're in, you know, public, um, going into a public place or anything like that. You know, it, it's a, you know, it's something you aren't doing to protect other people. Um, so should we require it is really the question you're uh, suggesting. And I have to say, you know, and I've had this conversation with um, one of the state reps who, who uh, on the other side of the aisle, who's been, you know, very collaborative and had good ideas. Um, and I think it's a, a, a something that when I look at the mitigation measures that we should be contemplating and making adjustments to, that is one that I think might be seriously important for us to, you know, consider for, you know, in the period going forward. Um, it, it, you know, look, anything that we can do going forward that, uh, that will, you know, protect people and at the same time make it more likely that we can have slightly, you know, different conditions for stay at home, uh, better conditions, you know, is, is a good move. Uh, there was some reporting yesterday done about the impact of this on farmers, some farmers having to dump milk here in this state. Mm -hmm. um, is there any program underway to help farmers to either, you know, do something with their product or get it to food pantries so that it's not going to waste? So uh, the, a couple things. The, this is a problem all across the country. Um, commodities, the prices of commodities have sunk to, you know, lows not seen in a while. Um, you've heard that about gasoline. You've seen it, gasoline. Um, and, uh, you know, and the same with corn, soybeans, uh, which are very important to the economy of the state. Um, so, you know, this is a problem across the board, and it's not just a problem for Illinois, it's a problem for every state. Um, I hope that the federal government is able to step in with either price supports or some kind of farm bill to support farmers uh, in this endeavor. Um, and I would love to get, far, you know, to get some of those goods uh, to support 
uh, the particularly the kids who are on free or reduced lunch um, who are would otherwise be in school getting it but but can't and so the school districts are distributing it so um, I would say to any farmer that has the ability to deliver some of that for us, I've talked to many of the food manufacturers across the country about donating, and many of them have donated goods uh, for use by the school districts in Illinois for low-income families, and so I would encourage them to contact us. We'd be happy to put them in touch with school districts. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, Dana. Yeah. <laughs> this is a uh, this is a question um, that I asked you indirectly yesterday, but it's a follow up. It was about a woman who uh, qualified for unemployment benefits, actually went to get certified, got her letter, mm -hmm. and was told because of an overpayment a couple of years ago um, that she has 20 penalty weeks and won't get any benefits for 20 penalty weeks and she can't get her unemployment stimulus because of it either. Since then, we've heard of other people in the same predicament. I was told by an IDES spokesperson last night, it's a law by statute that these penalty weeks are levied. So my question to you today, following up, which I am doing today is, is there anything you can do on an emergency capacity to potentially discuss deferring those penalty weeks? And if not, because it is a law, is there something you can do to urge lawmakers mm -hmm. to potentially review view this and step in because these are now desperate people. Yeah, and I uh, think it's an important point that, um, as you know, I can't change the laws that are in place. I, I have the ability by executive order to make adjustments to regulations um, and in an emergency to protect people's lives. Um, and uh, so I would suggest this is a situation that you're describing that I would very much like to look into the individual cases or have my staff look into the individual cases. I would I would also suggest that there are other supports that exist that by the state and by the federal government that they've recently created. And so to the extent someone actually, the law hasn't been changed and the legislature needs to, we should put on the agenda of the legislature if that's what's necessary. And then the other part of this would be, um, you know, that, that we should look at the other supports that could be provided to these individuals who happen to fall into this. It sounds like a, a kind of a peculiar, um, you know, space that they fall into, and we should be looking for how to rescue them out of that. So are you suggest follow up to this, and then I have two more quick yep. questions. Follow up. Mm -hmm. So is there, sh are you suggesting they should reach out specifically to your office? Yeah. Hey, they, but to be clear, just yeah. to be clear, yeah, yeah. like IDS said yesterday, you under law are only given penalty weeks if you are found to have committed some sort of fraud. So we can't actually change that law. Yeah, it's no, but I, what I was suggesting program. though is that the Um, many of the large states in the United States uh, are experiencing I extraordinary uh, overruns of, you know, of calls and, and uh, sessions online and so on. And, um, and so we're, we're, you know, we've had conversations with each other about that problem. Um, and here in Illinois, though, I'm, you know, pleased to say that, that we're at least, uh, you know, attempting heartily to, to um, you know, to address the the challenge that people are having getting through, and I talked about that the other day. So, I mean, you know, we'll continue to work on that. And finally, very quickly, um, piggybacking on what Marianne and Liz asked about, it, it comes to uh, seniors in particular. Are yeah. you, is there any discussion at the state level about alternate graduation dates and that sort of thing for <laughs> seniors? Uh, see, not senior citizens, but yeah, seniors in high school and, and college maybe. Um, I, uh, you know, there's a, there are lots of conversations about that. As you know, our, our initial focus, I mean, I realize we're now in the middle of April and the school year will be ending for people varyingly a month from now, a month and a half, or maybe in two months from now. Um, and so we're beginning to talk about what to do um, in the event that we, that school doesn't, you know, doesn't go back in session. But, um, but I, I will also say that uh, we've been focused more on, you know, as you can imagine, more on the challenge of getting e-learning up and running for all those kids, you know, even the seniors uh, need to finish out the school year. And so uh, that's been the focus of our education team. Um, but as you're pointing out, you know, in the last two months here of school, it's you know time to start focusing on graduation. And, you know, if a decision is made um, that people can go back to school, then that's, you know, they'll be able to have their graduation, perhaps not in the normal fashion, but some sort of 
you know, smaller group fashion. Um, and if the decision is made that we need to extend the stay at home and really keep people distanced more so than we'll be looking at something uh, that's radically different than a normal graduation, but we want to make it, you know, as best we can. I know how important that time of uh, someone's life is. Okay, we'll get to questions from online. Governor, last night, President Trump discussed at length the idea of state border checks. Has this been a part of your discussions with Midwest governors, and how practical is it? How would it be conducted? That's from Shia at Politico. No. What must the state do to ramp up broad contract contact tracing? Will this require hiring people? How will they be trained? How much will this cost? Is this underway? That's John O'Connor at the AP. Yes, I think it would be helpful, uh, John, you can uh, take a look at the uh, articles that have been written about the Massachusetts Collaborative. That'll give you a sense of what this looks like. But yes, it involves hiring people. It involves good old-fashioned shoe leather. Um, that is to say, not, people are not going to be knocking on doors, but they'll be uh, using an app uh, which will uh, populate with someone's spoken contacts. It's not, this is not an Apple Google app. This is one in which someone who has COVID-19 uh, reveals who their contacts are to someone over the phone. Um, and then that is all populated in an app. And through that app, uh, individuals who are part of the collaborative would have the ability to call the contacts uh, that have been uh, registered uh, to let them know that this person uh, has been diagnosed with COVID-19 and that they should self-isolate. Rich Miller at Capital Fasts asks, the upward curve in new cases has slowed, but it hasn't yet gone down. What are the scientists telling you about finally putting the state on a downward trend? <laughs> um, it, it's an excellent question, and we're, we're looking at uh, a variety of models. You know, we're, we're going to talk a little more about this in the next few days, but, um, uh, you know, the answer is that it's, as you pointed out, it's climbing. It's climbing at a lower rate than it had been before, and that's a very good thing. Um, what the other side of the curve looks like, I think looks very different than what the IHME uh, curve looks like, if you have gone online to look at that curve. Um, not just for Illinois, but for all the rest. It seems like their curve sort of peaks and then precipitously drops. And I personally and, and others that I talk to don't think that's how it's going to work. You're working your way up to a peak, unfortunately. And then as you come to the other side, it's going to be a gradual uh, downward slope, not an immediate drop. And so that is another reason why this, you know, testing, tracing, treatment is so important and why we can't do what I think uh, President Trump has described, which is sort of a, you know, a massive opening of a variety of states. Dave Dahl at WTAX, a leader of a local incident management team in Springfield has said the return to normal would probably be done by a, on a county by county process rather than statewide. What's the veracity of that? Hmm. Um, well, there are, I, I think that, as you know, we left in the hands of counties and cities a lot of decisions. Uh, the decisions, for example, about their own city parks or county parks, whether to open those. We've closed state parks. Um, you heard that the mayor of Chicago closed the lakefront. Uh, there are a variety of places that have made other decisions about uh, things that are not uh, in the executive orders. But things that are in the executive orders are state law, or, or I should say they're mandated by executive order. They're not state law. Um, and so they really can only be removed by the states. Um, and by this state uh, government. And so, uh, so I would, you know, encourage people to look at that, county administrators and uh, city uh, mayors to determine what it is that they might be able to change if they want to. Uh, but the most important thing I hope that they'll all follow is that we need social distancing. We need people to stay at home. This is from Bruce Rushton at the Springfield Times. A local pastor recently complained that he'd been told he couldn't have a drive-in Easter service. He pointed out that marijuana dispensaries are still open. Recreational pot isn't legal in most states. With that in mind, why are recreational pot sales allowed? What do you say to the pastor and business owners who have been forced to close? Um, I, I'm not sure how those are related, but I would say that um, the, the, the advice around uh, drive up and pick up, and that's what's happening at dispensaries, has been that it's very uh, brief contact um, and it's uh, somewhat socially distanced. 
Um, and so the handoff of, you know, of, of just as it is with a drive up and pick up food um, is relatively brief. The problem with a uh, religious service, and I am sympathetic with this because I, I too would like to worship in the way that we normally do, uh, or even in a drive up circumstance, has been that that's not a, uh, a, a quick endeavor. Um, and the result is that people end up parking very close to each other, opening their windows. It's as if they're sitting in pews very near to each other. And so it turns out that that is one way to spread COVID-19, and we want to avoid that. Molly Parker at the Southern Illinois, and I think is asking about the same letter that Marianne referenced, but I'm going to ask you this question anyway. Mm -hmm. Senator Shrimp and others wrote a letter to you requesting a uniform policy that empowers local health departments to make decisions concerning business closures and openings in their respective counties. What is your response to that proposal? Um, we will, uh, uh, from the state executive order perspective, we're, we're you know, looking at all of our state executive orders and thinking of the health and safety of everybody in the state, no matter where they live. And I, of course, understand the difference between living in a rural community and living in an urban community. And no, I really do understand that, you know, uh, that, that there are differences. That the problem is that you know, a restaurant in a rural community has the same ability to um, spread COVID-19 as a restaurant in an urban community. So um, it's really, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge to, to identify the things that are that much different. Uh, having said that, we have tried to make adjustments. You've seen, for example, that essential businesses includes virtually everything that's agriculture related, which is entirely, almost entirely in rural communities. So we are thinking about, um, you know, how to make differences between urban and rural communities. Um, you know, recognize those differences and let as many people work as possible without endangering people's lives. All right, this will be the last question from Rebecca Ansel at Capitol News, Illinois. Do you have any thoughts on the Municipal League's request to Attorney General Raul to issue an advisory opinion allowing local governments to delay the fulfillment of FOIA requests until the stay-at-home order is lifted? I don't really have an opinion about that. I mean, I <clears throat> we are working hard to uh, try to fulfill FOIA requests. It is hard, I have to admit, with you know limited staff, uh, with our legal staff, you know, constantly working uh, on a. Uh, I mean, I can't tell you how hard those folks are working, and those are the folks who review all the FOIA requests and try to fulfill them. So, as I said a few weeks ago, I hope that people will continue to have some patience with us about our delivery of FOIA uh, responses to FOIA requests. Um, but I don't have an opinion about the request to the Attorney General. Um, can I just say one thing before I conclude? Um, um, standing behind me is uh, General Rich Neely of our National Guard. You've seen him occasionally uh, with me here. And he's with us today in part because <clears throat> the National Guard has done such a tremendous job of standing up and taking over in some cases for federal government drive-through facilities. But it is the National Guard that has done not only that, but also when we needed to put in uh, additional capability at uh, one of our prisons, it was the National Guard that, that came in with medical personnel and tents uh, so that we could treat uh, and separate people uh, within the prison. Um, and the National Guardsmen have just been outstanding. I mean, you should be so proud, it's the best National Guard in the entire nation, Illinois' National Guard. We have the best adjutant general in the entire nation, and I just I want to recognize <clears throat> the amazing work that they do. Thank you all very much. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.